This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast, Chris Graham. One more for the week, and then early weekend for me, lucky me, it's my birthday week, so uh, I'm heading up to D.C. My wife and I on a long planned trip to uh, to catch a couple of Nats games, go to Hamilton on Friday night at the Kennedy Center. You know, we try to do this once a year. We get up in the summertime and and take in a, a few days of Nats baseball. My wife actually was surprising me to say, hey, that should, you know, that should take us to three Nats games, uh, you know, an O's game, a couple of Phil's games. What do you think about that? I surprised her then. I turned my ESPN broadcasting money. I don't get paid a tremendous amount, but I get paid you know, to, to, to broadcast those, those uh, VMI baseball games, Southern Conference baseball games, and I uh, turned those into Hamilton tickets. And uh, thanks, you know, in my view, I would do those games for free. I hope that Wade Brenner's not listening to me and takes me up on that next season uh, and, and, and donates some money to charity or something like that. But I would do those games for free. The way I look at it, I talk about baseball. We do 12 to 15 games a season, so I'm talking baseball. Those games go long. We're talking 40, 50 hours of baseball. I, I turn 40 or 50 hours of talking about baseball into Hamilton tickets, plus some extra. The Hamilton tickets weren't all that much in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but if I can turn talking about baseball into something tangible, that's okay. That's good life. That's good living right there. So so that's me. Yeah, so uh, the, 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 recording this podcast on Wednesday is the end of my work week. Lucky me. Um, but we'll still be following, even though, you know, I say it's the end of my work week. The gust of free press is 365, right? So... Uh, we'll be following all the news and sports in the world, including what we're going to talk about on our podcast today. And you've been waiting for me to talk almost two minutes now to get to the point of this podcast. Devin Hall, the long winding road to the NBA. It's the long winding road to getting to talk about Devin Hall here on the podcast. And I wrote a column about this today. And Devin Hall, we we, we fully expect, well, I'm, I'm, I think I fully expect to hear Devin's name called uh, in the latter stages of the second and final round of the 2018 NBA draft. I wrote a column about Devin Hall and his road to the NBA. Uh, and I, again, I expect to hear his name called. But if we don't hear his name called for some reason, don't be surprised. Uh, he's going to play summer league. He'll get an invite in the fall camp, and he'll have a great chance to play his way into a team like London Perintes actually did this past year, playing his way onto the roster with the Cleveland Cavaliers, played – with the Cavs, some uh, in the regular season, he was on the bench in the postseason, and then played for their G League affiliate. Devin Hall's got at least that case, and I think even a better case than Leonard Parentis, which is interesting because those two guys came in the same class, 2013, the 2013 resilient class of the NBA. And Devin Hall was actually the first point guard, both both members of that class point guards, at least coming out of high school. Devin Hall was recruited as a point guard uh, coming out of the Virginia Beach area. And uh, he was the first guy that, of that class to commit. In fact, UVA asked him to uh, reclassify uh, to come a year early. And then I think he committed sometime in July, and then sometime later in that process, maybe it was September or so, Leonard Parentes committed. And Parentes um, uh, ended up being the starting point guard for that team. Uh, and in fact, as we all know, you listen to this podcast, you're a UVA basketball fan, you know that Parentes. I mean, Parentis didn't start right away for that team, I shouldn't say. He, he, I would call him a four-year starter. Uh, it was after the infamous Tennessee game in late 2013 uh, that Parentis uh, accelerated to being the starter uh, for that team, and that's what changed that team's fortune. They were 9-4 uh, after that loss to Tennessee, the end of the non-conference schedule for EVA that particular season. They went 21-3 and from that point on. And uh, got to the you know won the ACC tournament, uh, won the ACC regular season and tournament, Sweet 16. A lot of us think if Anthony Gill doesn't go down with a sprained ankle against Michigan State, we're talking about a Final Four team, but that's what it is. So Parentes, you know, goes from there to being a four-year starter, and Devin Hall went the other direction. So after reclassifying to come out early, he ends up redshirting as a freshman, and. You know, you know the story here, I'm sure, but uh, maybe it, you know, maybe maybe you've forgotten some of these parts. But Hall, uh, so he reclassifies, he comes in, he falls behind Parentes on the depth chart. He's told by Tony Bennett and the staff, "Hey, you know, maybe you should redshirt. We're going to make you redshirt, but maybe you should redshirt. And um, if you do that, you know, we'll we'll support you. 
Hall's initial reaction was, I want to earn minutes. So I'm, going to keep, I'm going to keep playing hard and earn minutes. And uh, it was a, a long talk with Jason Williford, a former EVA player, of course, back from my days. I was a student at EVA from 1990 to 1994. Williford was 1991 to 1995. Williford talked about how, as a true freshman, first-year player at EVA, he played 36 minutes his whole first season and, and wishes, and go, going back, wishes – that he had redshirted that season instead of wasting an entire season of eligibility on 36 minutes of game action. And he essentially laid the case down to Devin, hey, you know, you could play 36 minutes this season or think about what a potential fifth season could do for you. So then think about this fifth season in, in a few minutes. But, you know, so he, he earns minutes as a second-year player, first, you know, redshirt freshman. He only played 10 minutes a game. He got 21 minutes a game as a junior. Uh, as a sophomore, it's just a redshirt sophomore junior in, in school eligibility. Now, at that stage, Hall graduated from UVA. This is the kind of kids UVA recruits. You got Malcolm Brogdon. You've got uh, you know who's going to solve the problems of the world after he's done with basketball. And Devin Hall graduates in three years. So he's a he's a graduate as a junior with sophomore eligibility. You know, he, basically he would have two years of eligibility as a grad transfer. If he wanted to go somewhere, there was a lot of talk about Hall transferring out of the program because, you know, there was still depth at the guard position for Tony Bennett's team heading into 2016-2017. But Hall, you know, true to his form, the, the same kid who said as a, as a as a true freshman first-year player when he's told he needs a red shirt, I want to earn minutes, he decides, I'm not leaving, I'm going to earn minutes here at Virginia. And he earns, the, again, the 21 minutes a game as a, as a – or excuse me, 27 minutes a game as a junior. Average 8.4 a game. You know, I I don't think that he's on too many people's NBA radar as a junior, but I I know myself. I mean, we watch the program closely all the time. I'm seeing some glimpses there. You know, I'm seeing you know he, he's a defensive stop from the perimeter. He can make some big shots. So I'm thinking going into his senior season of eligibility, what we call a senior season, his fifth year of eligibility, uh, or you know redshirt senior season. He's he's a two year graduate student by this point. I'm thinking high expectations, for me at least, of Devin Hall. He's he's a, a glue player. That's what I'm thinking, glue player. I'm thinking a guy that, you know, can can you know with with the the, the two the two young guys in the backcourt alongside him and Ty Jerome and, and Kyle Guy, he'll really be a great leader for this program. He and uh, Isaiah Wilkins can be great leaders for this program overall, and and he'll be a he'll be like a Jason Williford. You know, uh, my college roommate Jay Whitaker and I. Um, Jay could be doing this job just as easily as I could, except that he's a lot smarter. He's an engineer running a company somewhere right now. Uh, but Jay and I used to talk about Jason Williford as the glue of those those early 90s UVA teams. You know, he had uh, – of the recruiting class that Williford was a part of, he had Corey Alexander who played in the NBA, uh, scoring a lot of points, flashy point guard. He had Junior Burroughs, eventually played some in the NBA. You know, the, the power forward with the great turnaround shot post game. Uh, and Williford was the guy who just did the dirty work, you know, the guy who played defense, who grabbed rebounds, who, you know, moved the ball around the perimeter, did the dirt, you know, did the glue kind of things. I thought Devin Hall was a glue player. Devin Hall's more than a glue player, folks. Now, he might be a glue player in the NBA, but at, at UVA this past season, he was the best player on the team in my view. In fact, when I voted for all ACC teams this year, I voted him first team. I didn't vote Kyle Guy first team. Kyle Guy ended up getting first team all ACC honors. I voted Devin Hall. Uh, and as someone who watched the team closely, you know, I felt like maybe my vote was more so than more valued maybe than than those who you know outside looking in would see Kyle Guy and you know defenses certainly you know adjusting for him and and that kind of thing. But the numbers that Devin Hall put up this past year to me were were all ACC first team all ACC numbers. You know, he was 45.4 percent from the floor, 43.2 percent from three point range. He played 32 minutes a game. He was the best defensive player on the perimeter for this team, the best defensive team in the country. And I see, I see first team All ACC out of that, and I also see NBA out of that because the game that the way the game is played now in the NBA, it's not like it was even five years ago, but certainly you know 10, 15, 20 years ago, where if you average 11.7 points per game coming out of college, you're not getting a sniff from the NBA because you know the scouting wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. Now with all the analytics you can do, you can really pinpoint you know, who the better players are, right? And, and Hall's a guy. I mean, you look at those. You look at those fundamentals. Forty-three point two percent from three-point range. The one knock on him is that he doesn't get in the lane. Now I don't have numbers to prove this point, 
because I don't think the analytics are this far along yet, but my eye tells me, you know, and my eye having watched him play 34 times this year tells me that Devin Hall didn't have a lot of trouble, in my view, getting in the lane. UVA doesn't ask its, its guards to get in the lane an awful lot, but when Hall needed to from the perimeter, when he needed the dribble drive, it seemed like to me he was, he's a strong enough guy uh, at his size, you know, 6'5", he plays a little bigger than, to me, he plays a lot bigger than 6'5", but it's noted on the draft reports I'm reading that his wingspan isn't that significant. He's not that long, as they like to say, uh, in NBA draft parlance. But to me, you know, he, he's a strong kid. I mean, he's a kid, he's 6'5", he's a stout 220, uh, and, and he plays a lot stronger than you, you would see when you see him, you know, just out there standing on the floor for in pregame intros. One thing that struck out of, struck struck me about uh, Hall as well. I'm a guy, especially for home games, who gets to the arena a couple hours before tip. You know, I go back, get a quick bite to eat from the media room, but then I'm sitting out there courtside watching the guys warm up. I'm one of those basketball nerds. Hall was always the first guy out there, and he would be out there the longest time, shooting jump shot after jump shot after jump shot. A kid again who's a fifth year senior, who was an NBA draft prospect. And two hours before a game, he'd be out there with, with the uh, managers of the team shooting jump shot after jump shot after jump shot, the fundamental stuff. And Hall was out there taking care of business. And I'm talking about not just in November. I'm talking about in March at the ACC tournament. He's out there two hours before the game, uh, you know, before the first game at least, that Virginia played on Thursday. After that, you know, of course, the, I guess actually Friday night we were out there early too because we were the first game on Friday night down, uh, down, there, in, uh, down there, up there in Brooklyn. Uh, but uh, he's out there early, all season long, and you know that's that says a lot. He's a fifth-year senior. He's the he's the you know the emotional leader. He and he and Zay were the emotional leaders of the team. But he's also he's not wrestling those laurels. He's out there setting the example for everybody. Uh, you know, just just getting those extra jump shots in, and um, I think that says a lot. And I think NBA teams notice that kind of thing too. But also the fact that he became a defensive stopper over the course of his career. He, and again, the knock on him when you read the, the NBA scouts analyses, the draft draft Nick analyses of, of Devin Hall, what you'll see about Devin Hall is, well, he's not athletic enough. Well, you know, he's not long. He's not quick. And I'll say that even dating back to his early days at UVA, when he was, when he was recruited first as a point guard in that class of 2013, you know, a, a, a person I became acquainted with who was an assistant coach at the time at Fishburne Military School's post-grad team, when, when Fishburne Military School, a, street, a, a school up, up the street from where I live and work, uh, had a post-grad team. Post-grad teams, for those who may be not familiar with the term, post-grad teams are those teams of uh, guys who've exhausted their high school eligibility. There they, are a lot of programs across the country that, that offer kids that, that extra post-graduate year um, to play basketball, go to school. A lot of the kids, in fact, the kids at Fishburne, I know, uh, were taking classes through Shenandoah University. They would get between 24 and 30 credit hours uh, through their, their one year at Fishburne in the post-grad program. So... Uh, they would they would you know get 24 to 30 hours towards their degree, play some more competitive basketball, very competitive basketball. Actually, I, I went to a national tournament once. Those were incredibly competitive tournaments with a lot of really talented players. The gym would, the gym for for just uh, one-off games uh, would be full of college coaches. Just up the street from me here in Waynesboro, Roy Williams, uh, Virginia Tech assistants, Duke assistants. I, I sat down with Tony Bennett for a game as he was uh, scouting a couple players at a game at Fishburne. So. We're talking about really competitive games. And so a coach for this program says to me, hey, I coached against Devin uh, when he was in high school. Not athletic. He's, he's, he's a good player, fundamental player, but not athletic enough. Uh, I don't know how he'll do in the ACC. He goes from that to now we're talking about Devin being probably a mid-second round pick. So credit to Devin for overcoming a lot of obstacles. I mean, the naysayers like the assistant coach that I talked with who said not athletic enough. Tony Bennett himself saying, you know what, you're, you're not going to play a lot as a first year. You should redshirt. Um, in, steadily increasing his minutes. Hall is a senior, is all, you know, second team all ACC as it turns out, but I voted him first team all ACC. And so I'm giving Devin Hall credit, but I'm going to give Tony Bennett some credit here too. Because Devin Hall coming out of high school was a three star recruit. Um, probably, you know, the, the numbers and everything else about him coming out of high school would have suggested four star, but. The knock on him being athleticism or lack thereof knocked him back to a three-star. Well, 
He's going to hear his name called tomorrow night. I really believe he's going to hear his name called tomorrow night. And if you're Tony Bennett now, it's one thing. They hand you Justin Anderson. Justin Anderson could have played any sport he wanted to. I used to write about Justin when his career at UV, the first couple of years, it was questionable about whether or not he'd end up being an NBA player just because he wasn't putting big numbers up. He wasn't even earning starting minutes. As, as his first two years at UVA, he ended up being the sixth man of the year as a sophomore at UVA. But he just, he just had a hard time getting off the bench at UVA at times. But I said, you know what? If this NBA thing doesn't work out, NFL tight end or edge rusher. You know, I, I saw Julius Peppers in him. I saw Tony Gates in him. You know, you can turn a guy like that into an NBA player quite easily. All you got to do is teach him some fundamentals and make him listen a little bit, right? And Justin was, Justin was destined to be a pro something at some point after his time at UVA. Malcolm Brogdon, you know, I think that it became clear, at least as after his redshirt sophomore season, after his, his injury year as a true sophomore, that Malcolm was probably going to be an NBA player. Mike Scott was an NBA player. It was That was obvious from the time Dave Lato recruited him. Um, and I'm trying to think back. Joe Harris. Joe Harris is another example, actually, of, of the Devin Hall you know, a scenario where De uh, Joe was not a – Highly regarded recruit coming out of high school. He's an NBA player. In fact, he's, he's on his second contract now uh, and doing pretty well. Uh, had, a, had a pretty solid season this past year with Brooklyn. But So another great example then of, of Tony Bennett and what he can do for a three-star recruit is right there in Devon Hall. Uh, he can turn a three-star recruit with, with, with you know, practice, with repetition in practice, with what Mike Curtis does, uh, with the weight room, um, and, and then and – then, what you teach defensively at Virginia. When you're Tony Bennett, when you're Jason Williford, Ron Sanchez now departed for UNCC, uh, and the staff, uh, Brad Soderberg, et cetera, the staff there, what they, what they, what they drill into you from a, def a defensive standpoint all year long, not just, in this, not just in the basketball season, but all year long, the drills and everything else, NBA teams value that. You know, they, they value a guy like Hall who can score. He can shoot 43% from the, uh, the three-point range, 45% of the field can get in the lane despite what the draft Knicks have to say. The draft Knicks don't know much. The draft Knicks are just guys like me who started a website, in their case, call, them, call themselves draft experts. But, you know, you know, Hall can get in the lane. He can shoot the three. Um, he, he's a, he's, the, the intangibles are there in terms of his leadership ability on, in a, in a, in a, uh, on a roster. And if you question about whether or not a rookie can be a leader, just look at what Malcolm Brogdon did a couple of years ago as a rookie. He ends up being rookie of the year. But then, of course, even this past year in Milwaukee, you, you can come out and be a leader. Uh, and the the one knock to me that's real about Devin Hall is the same one that would have been a knock, well, about Mike Scott, uh, who had a redshirt year EVA about because of injury. Uh, you know, the same knock on Malcolm Brogdon, redshirt year EVA because of injury. You're coming out of you're coming out of uh, college. Uh, you know, five years after you started high school, or after you left high school, and um, you know. You got Marvin Bagley, you got DeAndre Ayton, you got XYZ player coming out as 19 year olds, 20 year olds, and so at 23, 24, you're old, you're an ancient guy, uh, and so you know the upside is is a question there as far as that goes because you're looked at the, the 19 and 20 year olds are looked at as well. We can work with them. We can make Mount Marvin Bagley a better defensive player. That's a knock on Marvin Bagley. Can he play defense? He can. He doesn't, but he can. He's athletic enough, certainly, too. He's athletic enough to do what he can do around the rim and shoot threes. Can he play defense? Yes. Has he played defense yet? No. Um, and, and defense is a commitment, just like anything else is. Whereas, you, so you, you can work with him. You can work with DeAndre Ayton, who's very much a raw prospect. Um, the question with Devin Hall is, okay, what we got with him, he's a five-year, he's a finished product coming out of college. Uh, and he's working with a guy in Tony Bennett, one of the best in the business as a five-year finished product. So that's what we got. There's no upside here in terms of we can take Devin Hall and make him into something else. We can take Marvin Bagley and make him into a defender. We can take Marvin Bagley and maybe teach him the NBA three. And then can you imagine how dangerous he'll be? He's, he was listed at 6'11 at Duke. Now there's question, is he really 6'11 or is he more 6'8 and three quarters, 6'9? Whatever the case may be, skilled guy around the basket. Uh, and, and we can teach him to... Get out to you know to to take this game out to the three point line, then dribble drive, and then we can teach him how to play defense. Maybe pass the ball every once in a while wouldn't be a bad idea either. With with him, well again with Devin Hall, Devin Hall's what you got. Devin Hall's is that's that's as close to a finished part as you're going to get. You're not going to see a lot of growth in Devin Hall. 
So that's looked at, it's odd, but it's looked at as a negative, that you can't do much more with Devon Hall than what Devon Hall already is. That was the same knock or similar knock that you heard about Malcolm Brogdon, again, a couple years ago. Fifth-year player, you know, solid fundamental guy, not very athletic, supposedly. He dunked on Kyrie and LeBron James uh, in the NBA, but nobody saw that coming. Justin Anderson wouldn't have seen that coming <coughs> in his time at UVA, right? But all those knocks on, on Malcolm Brogdon, and look at what he's done in the NBA. I think similar for for, for Devin Hall. So um, I think we'll see his name. I think we'll hear his name called tomorrow night. I really do. I'll be very surprised if we don't. Um, and I'll be following from Nats Park, assuming the weather holds out. The weather's not been very nice to us here in the Mid Atlantic the last few months. But I assume I'll be following from Nats Park to you know to see what happens with Devin Hall tomorrow night. A couple other names that have popped up as possibles but not likely and I'm gonna just just dismiss and, and nothing against them personally or their basketball acumen but Isaiah Wilkins uh, and Nigel Johnson both had, had some pre-draft workouts with NBA teams um, we know that Isaiah among other teams worked out for the Atlanta Hawks which makes sense his stepfather Dominique Wilkins had a cup of coffee or two with the Atlanta Hawks right so uh, and then I know that Nigel Johnson worked out for the Charlotte Hornets recently so NBA teams don't often call guys in to work out that they don't at least have some interest in. Uh, I don't know that we'll see either. Well, we're not going to see either or hear either's name called tomorrow night. Uh, there are some early prospects for an even number of teams, uh, and they're, te they're guys that might get fall camp invites. I would think particularly Isaiah. If nothing else, Isaiah earns a fall camp invite because he's a guy that one thing you know about Isaiah Wilkins, he will play defense, obviously the ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Um, and a guy that can guard anybody from one to five, um, proved so. He can guard anybody, he literally, in the NC State game. He guarded from 6'1 to 7 feet tall uh, very effectively in the NC State win back in January in Charlottesville. So uh, that's just one example of many what Isaiah Wilkins can do for a team. Offensively, he is exceedingly limited, and that's going to be the issue for him. You know, I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about how I was going to do a podcast on UVA's draft prospects coming into tomorrow night. Uh, Isaiah Wilkins, you know, he compares. I mean, in his you know his best case scenario could compare to a Draymond Green type. And I'm not trying to say he's Draymond Green. I'm saying compare and contrast, right? So Draymond Green coming out of Michigan State, he was known for his intangibles. He was known for his defense. A big a big guy, six eight two fifty. Isaiah is closer to 6'8", 230. But, you know, a guy who, who, who is known more in Draymond Green's case, Isaiah Wilkins' case, known more for their defense, their rebounding, and, and being glue guys. Like I talked about Devin Hall, right, being a glue guy. Uh, the difference is, you know, and, and you know, I don't know. I, I didn't watch Michigan State closely enough, didn't watch Draymond Green's career in college closely enough to be able to make this comparison at, at, at the same point in their careers. But you've seen Draymond Green as a pro – He's advanced. Uh, he's he's got a dribble drive game that's passable at least. You know, as part of Golden State's death lineup, he's definitely a, a guy that, you know, when he's got the ball at the, at the top of the circle at the three point line, uh, you've got to respect his ability to occasionally drain that three, and he can pick and pop. And, and then what he does elsewise, you know, distributing the ball uh, to Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, and Clay Thompson, um, Sean Livingston off the bench. But then also his rebounding, his defense. I mean, that's what that's what Draymond Green brings to uh, the Warriors in this case. You know, I want to compare uh, Isaiah Wilkins in the same way, and I wanted to see this past season as a senior. I wanted to see the same growth offensively, maybe not in terms of the numbers that we saw out of Devin Hall, but certainly in the efficiency. And I didn't see it out of unfortunately out of Isaiah this year. Uh, what what he could do. Uh, you know, in the UVA offense, the bigs, the fours and fives, set a lot of screens. That's their job is to set the screens. And then now it's not entirely, though, that the offense works to just get the perimeters open and then they shoot the ball or dribble drive. You know, the, the, the different screens include screens to free the guys up to get the three-point shots. Uh, but it's also if, if the defense cheats too much off those screens and tries to cheat towards the guards, you know, that, that leaves a, an option for the – the big setting the screen to either you know dive basically to the to the basket uh, to pick and pop uh, you, you know to post up there are post up plays in the offense and that's the that you know really 
you know, what we were looking for last year from a draft prospect perspective with Isaiah Wilkins, especially his sophomore and junior years, Isaiah showed, you know, demonstrated the ability to to be able to knock down the the pick and pop, you know, 15 feet out to 19 feet out to 20 feet. Um, but he, he never really seemed to have a consistent post game. And, you know, the dribble drive game definitely was not there from that standpoint. No respect for him in that re- in that context from defenses. And um, and even it felt like to me, I don't have the numbers in front of me. In fact, I could probably pull them up here as we're talking. Uh, but it seemed to me that he took a step back this year in terms of even knocking down, you know, those two-point shots that were given to him in the context of the offense. I'm thinking most memorably the Duke game down in Durham. Uh, and I'm going to pull his numbers up here real quick to see. I've got uh, KenPalm.com here up at the fingertips. Um, his two-point percentage in 2018 was 51.9%. It was 55.5% last year, so it did go down a little bit. Um, three of 17 from three-point range, four of seven last year. Not enough to really, you know, small sample size in both cases. I don't know. It just felt like to me, again, you know, that Duke game, they really exploited. Duke really exploited uh, Wilkins in that game. In terms of they essentially they played that zone defense and sagged off him and said you know basically drive to the basket get that pick and pop uh, we'll be happy if you beat us because that means Kyle Guy is not beating us it means Tiger Rome is not beating us it means Devin Hall is not beating us uh, we're not we're gonna we're not gonna let them beat us we're gonna let you beat us and he couldn't do it DeAndre Hunter fortunately for Virginia that was around the time you know in fact it was a couple of games before that that Hunter really emerged as a guy who could play the four for Virginia and play that role as a zone buster in the middle of the offense uh, in that same place that Isaiah Wilkins had patrolled so well, really from the midpoint of his second season on, that uh, Hunter won that game for Virginia. Uh, even though he got hurt late, Hunter won that game for Virginia with his ability to both hit the, the little 12- to 15-foot jumper in the middle of the zone but also dribble drive and create opportunities either for himself or for offensive rebounds for his teammates or passes for his teammates. I wanted to see the same thing out of Isaiah, just didn't see it. And so I don't know that we'll see out of Isaiah, you know, much more than a chance. He's a, he's a guy that will get a call in, in September to say, hey, come to our camp. We want to we want to you know, give you a chance to make our team uh, in, in camp. And largely he'll get the invite because he'll prove a really tough test for young guys, first and second year players, uh, professional players who are trying to make an NBA roster. Uh, it's kind of like he's kind of like he's the – you know, in a, in, a, in a boxing kind of frame of mind, you know, he's he's the he's the number two or three contender. You got to beat him to get the chance at the, at the champ. And if you can, you know, if you can do some stuff with Isaiah yourself offensively against his defense, then okay, maybe you're good. But I I just don't know if that earns him enough of a chance in the NBA roster. Um, and and for Isaiah's sake, you know, I don't I don't know if I want to see him languish in the G League. I'd like to see him go to Europe and do what Anthony Gill has been able to do and really flourish overseas. Wouldn't surprise me to see Anthony Gill get a look perhaps this summer, either with Summer League or going into the fall with a camp invite, because Gill is really, again, he's he's changed his game overseas. A guy at Virginia who scored most of his points around the basket has now become a, a depth perimeter shooter, three-point shooter uh, in, European, uh, in the European League. So, uh, But Isaiah, I'm not sure. Nigel Johnson, another guy. Nigel's a guy who's, you know, he, he, he played at three schools. He played at Kansas State, Rutgers, and Virginia. Uh, didn't get a lot of time at Virginia last year. No fault, I'm sure, of his own. It's the system. It's tough to get into, especially, especially as a first-year player. He was an only, only year player as a grad transfer. You know, the, the issue for Nigel is probably size. He's, he's not just short. I mean, you know, guards can be 6'2", guards can be short. But it's the, the lack of heft, I think, is an issue for him. Um, and you know, his, 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 he can get to the basket. I mean, I'll give him credit. He can get to the hoop. He can, he can knock down the, sh- the open three. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just wonder if, if uh, you know, and, and defensively he does have at least a year in Tony's system. I'm just not sure it's enough. He's a guy who got, you know, again, he had a, a pre-draft workout with the Charlotte Hornets. He's probably a European guy. He's going to make money in Europe. So, you know, no, no, don't, no feeling sorry for Nigel Johnson. Uh, I think he's got a, a flourishing career in Europe as a, as a penetrator. Uh, a guy who can disrupt uh, both offensively and defensively. You know, he can really – his ball pressure is really solid. I just don't know, again, size-wise and, um, and skill set-wise. I'm, I'm not sure he's he stands out as a small guard. 
uh, in a very crowded you know pool of players that can play that position in the NBA um, for for Nigel. So, uh, and I'm glad. You know, let's just say we're we're all glad. I'm not talking as we're finishing up the podcast here. We're all glad I'm not talking about DeAndre Hunter's draft prospects because he'd be a first round pick, um, and you know there'd be no doubt about that. Fortunately, we have one more year with him, and that's what we can count on, folks. We got one more year with DeAndre. I think he's the preseason favorite for ACC Player of the Year. If he's not, the folks at Operation Basketball are bonkers if they don't make him the preseason favorite for Player of the Year next year. Um, and uh, you know, so enjoy next year with him. Uh, and uh, and next year's team should be a fun one. But I think that'll break us down for our UVA pre-draft analysis again. Uh, I am on a mini vacay. I say mini because, yeah, I'll still be following tomorrow night. and We'll be reporting as best we can. It, it, you know, When you run your own news website, you're the editor, you're the chief writer, you're also a bottle washer. You have all these contributors filing into you. You, you. you don't really take a day off. I work 10 hours on Christmas Day. It's just the nature of the beast. But I'm hoping to get some time. I got tickets to Nats games. I got tickets to Hamilton. For those three-hour periods, I'm probably, especially the Hamilton, I'm very inaccessible. Uh, but uh, we'll be following the draft, and uh, we'll let you know not just about the prospects for the UVA guys we just talked about, but also the rest of the ACC. We follow the ACC closely, so, you know, we'll be rooting for our guys. Now at this stage, I'm, I'm rooting for the guys I know, um, and uh, we'll see how they go, and we'll tell you about it here on Augusta Free Press as well. Uh, sorry we couldn't catch up with Scott German to get his thoughts on all this, but Scott will join us next week when we get back from – in D.C., and um, we'll talk some more UVA sports, football, basketball, whatever the case may be. Signing off for myself, Chris Graham, here on the podcast, as I always do, wahoo wah.